All right, here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Uh, first of all, uh, um, where are you from? Where did you grow up? I'm from Orlando. I uh, grew up a little bit up north and uh, been all over the place. Where up north? Uh, Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania? Uh, uh, any place specifically in Pennsylvania? Uh, no. <laughs> And, and your family, uh, the, the family that you grew up with, uh, uh, what was the dynamic there? Brothers, sisters? I'm an only child, but um, my family really consisted of like my two best friends, Larry and Tim, and my sister Bunny, and Angie, which was Larry's sister. So we all like, you know, helped raise each other and stuff like that. And, uh, and was that mainly in Pennsylvania or mainly in Orlando? Um, parts of Pennsylvania, yeah. Oh, okay, okay. And, and was, was anybody in your uh, immediate family growing up an entertainer? I mean, was there anybody that? Uh, my mom was an entertainer, you know? And I say was, because my mom, I mean, I told, told a joke about my mom, but she passed last August. And uh, so I decided to keep the joke in because it was funny. And I figured she'd be in heaven, but you better talk about that, that joke, do that joke, boy. <laughs> Ain't nothing to be sad about. I was 90 something years old, do that damn joke. So, uh, so my mom was entertaining. My grandma was funny, you know. And my friends Larry and Tim, we were laughter. Like you know, nowadays kids have video games and and t technology. All we had was like sitting on the steps and just laughing. That's all we did. Yeah. yeah so who knew? <laughs> and and when when you would do that, was there uh, was it just riffing with each other, or was there actually sometimes some structure to it? No, it was just riffing. It was just, we, we would laugh at the stupidest stuff. We were the type of people who would go to the movies and be so entertaining, people would stop looking at Bruce Lee. <laughs> <laughs> we would start cracking on people and doing all that stuff. So, and we would, oh man, we had a great time. Did, I have a question. Yes. Does anyone care about this? Yeah. Oh, okay, just checking. Because the lady looking at me like I owe her money, but go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> You know, and, and, and I find this to be true. We've been doing these interviews, these podcasts, since December. Uh, so we've, we've, we've had uh, about a dozen comedians. And one of the things that, that seems to be common, uh, a common through line with most comics, is that we uh, don't really like uh, or, or we don't really enjoy just sitting and talking seriously and having an audience not responding. In, yeah, in it's, it's, it's weird. You know, it's like um, but all comics and actors, you all fantasize. Because I've had many interviews with Jay Leno and David Letterman. It's just that it was on my couch in my <laughs> house. <laughs> you know, but I figure, you know, put it out in the universe, you know. But, I mean, that format, yeah. But this right here is very uncomfortable. It's like going to church with no drawers on. It's just... <laughs> <laughs> I was uh, I was in a theater department at University of Memphis, and uh, and whenever uh, whenever I was um, and I was a comic relief uh, character in a lot of plays, mm -hmm. and uh, but then there were certain plays that usually I was either comic relief or I was the villain, and uh, and and in one particular uh, play I was not the comic relief, and uh, and we were I was I was uncomfortable with it, and the director was had known me, and he said he said you know when you when you play comedy, you overplay it. Mm -hmm. You come out of your character because you play the audience. You know, you play the audience. And he goes, when you do that, you've come out of character, which I, I didn't even think right. about, didn't even know I did. And I told him, I said, you know, if I'm not getting a response, if I'm not hearing something from the audience, I get uncomfortable because I feel like I'm losing them. Right. And he said, no. He said, after a while, you'll begin to get a feeling for when you have them and there's no sound right. at all and that's hard for us because right. we have that there's not much right. moment for that right i learned something from bill cosby he was doing an interview with the late tom snyder on one of tom snyder's old shows and he talked about bombing mm -hmm. which you can't really imagine bill cosby bombing and he bombed the first show and the club owner told him he said you um you made the crowd you made the show bigger than you Right. And that's something I remember before every show. Never make the show bigger than yourself. And you, when you hit the stage, from the moment you hit the stage, Philly, uh, you, it's, it's like a 50 caliber machine gun and three hand grenades just went <laughs> off. And, and really, it, it, there's not much let up. You know, the barrel is hot the whole time. Uh, where, 
did you develop that style? Is that natural to you, or did you develop that as you were on the road? I don't know, and I don't want to know. <laughs> All I know is uh, it's mainly because of the energy. Sit down, lady! <laughs> <laughs> it's, mainly, it's mainly because of the <laughs> <laughs> I think she pissed the pants right there. She, I think you're right. Then the pins came in handy. She, uh, no, it's mainly because of the crowd. It's mainly because of the crowd, you uh -huh. know, because like I really did play a Jewish American um, retirement community, and they really were like 80 plus, and I couldn't come out with that because the pacemakers would have just exploded. Right, 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 right. And so, uh, you know, I had to be more of a, you know, a shtick comic, but the check didn't bounce, so I didn't care. Right. <laughs> so, and that was actually, I was gonna ask you that question. Have, have you ever, uh, uh, because I, I, to me, it, it takes, a, uh, it's hard for most comics, and me included, to get comfortable with silence, you know, to, to yeah. set something up. But in that, I was gonna say, have you done an audience like that where you pulled back, you more just talked to the yeah. audience and let that flow, and? They're called corporate events. Yes. <laughs> and corporate events, and for those who don't know, they pay a lot of money. Yeah. And so I used to take it personal, and then our good friend Tim Wilkins said, yes. just take the check. And that's what I've done. And the thing about corporate events, like most of you people are in corporations or in jobs or whatever, and if you go see a comedian or have a comedian come to your Christmas party or whatever, you will not give me the same response that you gave tonight because you're afraid of your boss for some reason. And, but, so I always look for the boss and say, okay, boss, you laugh, then all your punk-ass employees will laugh. <laughs> and you take them same people, put them in here, put them in the improv, put them wherever they, but at the corporate, oh, that was, ho, 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 ho. Is the boss laughing? Okay, I'll chuckle. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. I think so many times when we go to those events, like in here, it's dark, and, and there, it's dark for a reason. You know, it's dark, it's a little cool in here, it's a little chilly. Uh, all those kind of things uh, uh, help you laugh more, and the fact that it's dark, you're anonymous you don't see each other, which is big. We're in corporate events, all the time, they're looking they're at each other. You're sitting on top of a damn lamp. Yeah, you know. But I didn't know the thing about the temperature helps people laugh. Yes. I need to bring ice to the show. That's yeah. Yeah, hot, yeah. hot is not good for comedy. Did you wash your hands? Oh, okay. Why would you? That's right, lady. Don't wash your hands after number one. <laughs> That's now, nasty. you... Um, <laughs> Back to the show. You got it. Now, of course, you comment right off the bat. Of course, here we are in Sarasota, Florida. We don't, we don't draw an extremely large black clientele. Not that we don't try. Uh, just not a lot here. Uh, and the in, ones that were here left. Yes. As soon as we started talking, they got it's the that hell curfew, out. It's that curfew, I'm telling you. It's I like, know. It's crazy. It's after 9 o'clock. Kiss my ass, damn it. I'm out here. Which you make jokes about. And as I was thinking about that, you know, and I know in tour, when you tour, whether it's the, the good week-long clubs or the funky ones or especially the, the crazy-ass one-nighters that mm -hmm. you play, it's very seldom that a white comedian gets sent to a primary, primarily black population center to play a primarily black club. Almost never, very rare. But you guys often go into the white club, white section of town. Have you ever been, and, and you're used to it, and you know how to play it, but have you ever been gone to somewhere, some city somewhere where you went, this is really uh, unnerving? It's called the state of Georgia. <laughs> and, no, actually, that's, that's not true. You know what's interesting? Not Atlanta. <laughs> no, but you know what's interesting? Um, I learned something recently within the past few months. Mm -hmm. I was watching, a, again, I'm watching YouTube in an old Chris Rock interview, and he said, um, Tavis Smiley was interviewing him. He asked him about, is a club, is this a show different 
performing for Apollo versus performing for the Shriners. And Chris Rock says something I will never forget and I think about now before every show. He says, it, he said it doesn't matter. He said at some point James Brown was probably more comfortable in the Apollo. And this is what he said. I'm not just saying this because I was joking with you. He said, but at some point he can go to Poland and get the same reaction, okay, because it just doesn't matter. So right now I'm blessed to be at a, at a place in my career, which I think it just doesn't matter. Right. You know, so I just enjoy it, you know. But, you, but at, at any point in your career, you didn't end up in some, you know, uh, um, crazy city, some crazy one-nighter where you went, this could go bad. Uh, I'm sure I did. I probably blacked it out or blocked it out of my mind, <laughs> you know. Because my biggest, my biggest fault, and I'm, I'm always, I mean, we're all like this, is um, you can have 80 great show, stand ovation, and you have one bad show, and what do you think about the whole way home? Yeah. The one bad show right. where the 95-year-old lady pulled out her titties, <laughs> and, and everybody laughed at that, but not laughed at you. So it's, you know, but um, it, again, it doesn't matter at this point, you know. How, how old are you? I will never tell my age. Oh, okay. All right, fair but enough. But it begins with a three. All right. And, uh, Times. And, uh, <laughs> Where, uh, where did you pick up uh, Philadelphia? It's a name, that's a, it's a middle name, and uh, it's a whole long story behind it. And I always said I would only tell that story on Letterman or Leno. All right. So I've been holding that for a long damn time. <laughs> we don't Eddie Brill that. need to find me. Yes, he does. Yes, he does. Um, at this, you, you've been doing comedy now for how long? Ooh, talking about the good years? Yes. Uh, I've been doing it like consistently like 10, 15 years. Okay. Consistent, like making Did you money. go to college? Oh, this is how college got me really in the stand up. I'm gonna tell you oh, why. Okay. I was, in, I was in class one day and uh, a professor was reading a paper and he started reading about some open micers and who's gonna be a big star and my name was in the article and I'm in the class going, what the hell I'm doing here? And I said, well, I don't need college. I'm going to be a big star. It's all in the paper. <laughs> I wish I'd have stayed in school sometimes. <laughs> but that's a very true story. He said, Philly Blouden is one of the rising up and coming comics. And everybody, and I never knew anything. I didn't know it was a reviewer uh -huh. in the audience that night. It was an open mic just like tonight. Hey, by the way, these open mic guys, they were awesome, I thought, you know? Yeah, they were. <laughs> very good. Yeah, they're so, a good guy. So you went right from that, from college, from uh, at a college right level, college to, right to stand-up comedy. Right to being broke, yes. Okay. So, so no, no, no real jobs of any significance. I had real jobs. I hated every second of them. I so, what's a couple of real jobs you had? The one real job I had was I was driving um, uh, kids around who, special need kids, they had cerebral palsy, they were blind, um, autism, or whatever. And they got mad at me because I was cracking jokes, but I would never crack on them. Mm. So they all wanted to be treated like everyone else. So this one girl said, you don't crack jokes on me. And I said, oh, I wipe that spit off your neck then. And she, <laughs> thought, that was, she thought that was hilarious. That's great. That's a very true story. And I another thing it. that happened, I, uh, I was that. talking to a girl that's like you and I are talking right now, yes. and the chick had a seizure, and I didn't know what was going on. She was talking like this. She said, I was like, damn, was I that funny? What the hell? And then I said, I think something's wrong with this lady, this girl in my, my van, something wrong. And one of the other drivers heard me say, oh, she was having a seizure. She'll bounce back. And like 10 seconds later, she went right back into her story. So, and then I said to my mom, right? <laughs> I was like, damn, this is crazy. <laughs> That's a true story. I should have told that story in the show. You should wow. have. I forgot that damn story. Well, and, and you know, I, I have a program here. I have a program here working called Special Olympics, where we do where we have the uh, uh, a lot of the young adults from the Special Olympics program, uh, and, and uh, uh, kids with all kinds of uh, mental challenges and autism and this that and the other that to do stand up comedy. And what you just said is very true. You know, uh, uh, as a group, and now we've gotten to know each other so well. 
they they bust on each other and they, they and they you know it. and and it's really once once uh, uh, that trust level hits yeah. and, and everybody knows nobody's trying to be mean spirited. It's had, just fun. I had a girl. This is a true story. I think she called it's, it is savant something something savant. I yeah, know. I don't know what they call. It. Right. Okay. Where she they're was, very very bright about one just one thing. Right. She was blind, uh -huh. but she can tell me how to get to her house. And she was like, you need to make a right turn. She was like the first GPS now that I think <laughs> And you need to make a left turn. And I'm driving, and I'm going like this in her face, like, this chick is pulling my leg. And then she got out the van, and she turned around and said, stop waving your hand in my face. I can smell it. And I'm like, I'm going to hit this broad with this van. <laughs> But she was blind as a bat, but she knew her way around. And I, that, was, that, was, that was some Twilight Zone stuff right there. Sure. Was, her other senses were so hair. acute. He got red um, hair. You see his hair? Yeah. Oh, yeah. The waiter guy's, yeah, has he's red got, hair. He got some, he's, a, he's a DJ. Oh. A DJ man. <laughs> That's right. Um, one more question, and then I have a last question. And after this, I want to open up to the audience. If the they want to ask me questions? If they want to. If you want. You don't have to. We can move on. If you want. Uh, uh, from, at this point, you said Letterman, Leno, goals. Ten years from now, where would you like to be? Uh, not in the unemployment line going, I need to get a regular job. Uh, ten years from now, let me tell you what's going to happen to me, okay? I'm going to tell everybody this. I'm going to be a full-time cast member on a hit television series, okay? Uh, and I don't give my own or whatever. I don't really want my own because that's too much pressure. <laughs> Everybody with their own series, they on drugs or they making love to like albino midgets or something. So I'm gonna be a full-time cast member on a hit television series. I'm gonna be in some films and everything. Is, I think my success is gonna come late and my only goal in life is to make my kids proud. That's my only That's goal. That's great. And how many kids? Two kids, boy and a girl, um, Faith and Theo. And how old? 19 and 18. Oh, that's super. Yeah. And uh, I, I don't think I even knew that. Um, and now, uh, you can bring the house lights up a little bit if you want. Don't y'all ask uh, Very quickly, crazy. if you have any questions, if someone raises their hand, I'll repeat the question so people watching on the web will know the question. Why they ask a question you already asked? I know. <laughs> Anything? And sometimes we get nothing from the audience. Oh, there's one over there. Yes? What was the moment that you knew you succeeded at what you were trying to do? What was the moment you knew you succeeded at comedy? Uh, when I started getting checks. <laughs> I started getting paid. And, um, you know... Here's a true story. I lied about being a headliner for a while. I stole that from a friend of mine named Happy Cole. You know, uh, oh, I know Happy. He lied a lot. He a lied. Long time too. And <laughs> they put, it was a club in uh, Fort Myers, Florida, and they said, you know, they made me the headliner, and I was scared to death, but I knew how much I was getting paid, and I winged it, and I've been a headliner ever since. Yeah. That's all right. Yeah. That's all right. I think a lot of us do that. Yeah. You know, yes, I can do it. And what really helped me develop my, my show was um, cruise ships, actually, as much as, I hate, as much as I hate them now. Man, look at that chick, in the, look at that chick right there. She, oh, my God. Hey, baby. Oh, uh, really? But uh, I, when I first got, it was a day cruise ship, and I, went, and I auditioned to be a dancer. I was a dancer in college. And I went to a dance audition, and I said, the ad said Janet Jackson type dance. I said, I can do that. You know, that's when Rhythm Nation was hot. Mm -hmm. I can do that. And this dude threw down the combination. I was like, I'm not going to pull out my nuts. I said, I could tell some jokes, and at that time, I had maybe, luckily, like maybe 10 minutes, mm -hmm. and that was a day, and I kept going and going, and then I got on the bigger ships, and I was getting a lot of money, and uh, it, it was crazy, so that's kind of, you know, when it kicked in. Yeah, yeah okay. Another question? Is there anything? Do you still do cruises? No, I hate cruises now. <laughs> Don't like the cruises. I, I, a lot of work on cruises now, the, even the, more than there used to be. It's so political. Let me tell you about cruises, okay? <laughs> a cruise ship is the only place where you can get a standing ovation and the next show get a standing ovation, but one person complains and that's what they focus on. Mm -hmm. And they and that just that just wore me down. I was like, I can't do this no more. You know, and then they would say, You if you said something to offend someone, I said, Well, what did I say? Well, we don't know, but don't say it again. <laughs> Wow, sounds like the FCC, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, it's pretty much. <laughs> it's like the logic of marriage. <laughs> Any other questions? No. My last question uh, is, uh, and we talked about, is there, is there a, um, 
You can ask me my is there a question. great bit you haven't written? And that is something, maybe some great personal story, some, some, something exposing an injustice that's really pissing you off, or, or something really enlightening or inspiring that, that, you, that you have in your gut, but you just haven't written yet. I have... I've had an amazing childhood. I've had an amazing childhood. I haven't even touched the surface of my childhood. And I don't have to put much embellishment on it. All I have to do is tell the stories how they actually happened. And that would be an hour and a half on top of whatever else I'm doing at that time. And that's the only thing I haven't like, got the, the lock undone yet. But my, like, just telling stories. Like, one of the guys I, I look up to, but he's short, is Kevin Hart. Yep. And Kevin Hart, he tells great stories. He's like the hip hop Cosby to me. And he tells great stories. And I have stories, like, so many stories that I can, oh man. And it, one day I'm gonna do it in front of the right audience. Because when you're unknown, or not, I don't have that much notoriety, but people really, Unless you're like real great writer, people don't really sit down and go, oh, this story is great or whatever. But something about the energy with a little, little salt and pepper on your career, mm -hmm. it can, it, people will pay attention more, yeah. mm -hmm. in my opinion. I don't know. Yeah. I could be wrong. And these stories I have are just amazing about Wilton Street, more stories about my mom, how I couldn't walk past a tree. It's a whole <laughs> bunch of stories. And I, and, I, and I text a bunch of my friends, and I told them to... You know, tune in tonight, and if they did tune in, it's a lady named Margot Allen, who I love to death, who's right now on the floor, <laughs> crying. <like laughs> is this like tape? Can they tape this and see this? Oh yeah. Oh, as a matter of fact, when you when you go to our YouTube channel uh, tomorrow, this will be archived, as all of them are, or any point in time. Okay. This will be archived, and you can pull it up and you can watch it later if you yeah. like. We'd like to thank everybody for coming out. Philly will be thank with you. us through Saturday night.